Cherry on Top is written, produced, and hosted by Matt Rebar. Chapter 1. If you were to spot Cherry Santiago in a restaurant, you would probably have one of three reactions. The first reaction would be, wow, she's an incredibly attractive woman. The second might be jealousy, based on the inevitable fact of the first reaction. And the third reaction might be, okay, maybe she's a bit too done up. Cherry was certainly done up in the restaurant that night, accompanied by two people that looked like white paint to her exuberant shades. The three were at Sizzler's, a steakhouse located in Strongsville, a suburb of Cleveland. Strongsville was the kind of place that had pretty much everything one would want in a suburb, except if you asked any Strongsville resident, they'd probably complain they were missing a certain chain restaurant or business. This is rich, Cherry muttered, casing the menu with intrigue while clicking her tongue. Cherry might have the body of someone who looked like they were picky with food, but Cherry loved food and loved eating food. Those who were jealous of Cherry's looks would find themselves further enraged by finding out that Cherry had a fast metabolism and an ability to gain weight only in the right places. What's rich? asked Hazel Matthias, one of Cherry's two accomplices for the evening. They had the salad as a happy hour item, Cherry barked, slamming the menu down like she was ready to fight the menu on a cable network wrestling show. Salad isn't worthy to be on the happy hour. Who's getting happy hour salad? The girls after work? Exactly. Emily Nagoon shifted her eyesight to a group of giggling girls who were drinking cheap margaritas and having happy hour salad. Cherry rolled her eyes and looked at the fried mozzarella sticks at the nearby table. Cherry, it's 702. Happy hour ended, Hayes countered. We're going to pay full price, which isn't great considering I know our salaries. You better believe we're writing this off as a work expense, Emily mumbled while eyeing the steaks. Ribeye, medium rare with mushrooms and a side of ribs, here I come. I think I can get us happy hour prices. Cherry waved her hand like she was swatting a lazy fly. How much do you want to bet? Fine, if you can get us happy hour prices, I'll buy your first drink, Hayes conceded. Granted, the company's going to buy it, eventually, but take the bet as you will. <laughs> Deal. Cherry shook on it, pulling back an eye in the servers. Half of the servers were male, but only three of them looked like they were straight. After all, would a straight male server have blonde highlights or a diamond stud or wear a rainbow flag button? The only problem was that they hadn't even met their server. Cherry knew that she could muster a straight male server, or a woman who was somewhat into women, for deals. Cherry was likely to swindle a discount from a gay man, but straight women were extremely hard for Cherry. It just wasn't her demo. Like the fruit that was her namesake, Cherry had long, bright red hair, two big, smacking lips, tanned skin that would fit right in at New Jersey, and two double Ds that were like a happy, honeymooning couple, pressed tightly together. Tonight, Cherry had pulled out a glittery pantsuit, which put her chest on display, and hugged her form like paint on a wall. Rarely did Cherry wear things that were unflattering, and especially for their current case, Cherry needed clothes which made her look like the sweetest fruit on the vine. Cherry was sometimes ditzy, but had moments of true mental fortitude. Having grown up in a sexist society, Cherry had come to be a master of the straight man. She knew their minds and weaknesses and was very effective at exploiting them like a gold mine miner. Cherry's hidden abilities included getting people to trust her with secrets, having people stupidly underestimate her, and distracting people with her looks and assortment of ensemble pieces. There had been many times where Cherry's hair extensions or a hefty handbag had saved the day. Finally, the waiter approached their table, and Cherry grinned. She had lucked out. Their server was definitely a straight man. Welcome to Sizzlers, where everything sizzles, the server said in a way which implied he wished he didn't have to reiterate the restaurant's terrible catchphrase. The server's name tag read Samson in a rather desolate script, as if Samson had written it while selling his soul to Sizzlers. His depressed eyes soon caught the light off Cherry's rack, which produced a small smile. Hi, Samson, Cherry grinned. How are you today, big boy? I'm great. Samson was not a big boy. He was lucky to be tall enough to ride the scariest roller coaster at Cedar Point, but Samson certainly wasn't the first pick at the community basketball court. How are you, ma'am? Call me Cherry. Cherry snickered, extending a hand and brushing Samson's hand. 
If this was a video game, a large, super effective sign would hang over the room while the sound effect for a boner banged in the background. Hayes and Emily were familiar with Cherry's skill sets. They knew this man was more toast than a millennial brunch. Okay, Cherry? Samson's voice was almost hypnotic, as if Cherry could swing her breasts like a pendulum to cause surrender. Cherry cleared her throat and was now ready to free throw her shot. So, I had a question. We got sat at like 6.58, so can we still order the happy hour? If you could do that for us, I'd be so grateful. The video game KO sign floated above Samson's body. Oh, oh yeah, that's easy. I got you, so so what do you want? Cherry and Hayes ordered off the happy hour menu. Emily grabbed a couple happy hour drinks too, but she still ordered her ribeye steak with the trimmings fit for someone with actual money. Samson slowly swam away, as if caught in the tides of love. Damn, you're good, Hayes whispered. It's like you have a PhD in how to manipulate men. They deserve a little manipulation, Emily muttered. After all, they've ran this planet for centuries upon eras. It's time for the women to have their fair share. I'm the biggest feminist I know, Hayes argued to both looks of suspicion from Emily and Cherry. Okay, correction, the biggest male feminist I know, but I figured feminists didn't want the distinction. Hayes Omathias was dressed in his flannel best, which included slim-fitting jeans that went from his thick thighs to his meaty legs. He normally wore boot-cut dress shoes and slicked his hair back with gel and product. His beard was scraggly, but neat. Hayes would hate it if you described him as a lumberjack, but that's exactly what he kind of looked like. Hayes gave off the impression that he wrote freeform poetry in the woods while carving handmade furniture before setting in for a vegan dinner made from his own garden. Hayes was street smart, a bit sarcastic, and always ready for a challenge. He wasn't the full-blown Casanova, but he knew how to be charming, and if he couldn't charm someone, he could at least socially settle a situation that needed soothing. Hayes' special powers included how he could easily adapt to a situation. He also thought outside the box, so he came up with good ideas and theories. He rarely detoured from situations and was usually headstrong and positive. Hayes was also in a band called Good Faith that was like if New Order and Depeche Mode had a baby that never went anywhere past the local scene. All right, do you see our man? Emily asked, steering the conversation back to the whole purpose of why they were at Sizzler's. They weren't just here for the happy hour or the steak. Nope, but I see our drinks. Cherry-eyed server Samson, who was hustling to get those happy hour drinks back to them. Damn, you have this boy running across the restaurant, Hayes chuckled, watching while Samson dove past two servers and scooted between two chairs. I can't even get people walking to a live show for my band. Yeah, people are walking to your live show, Emily said with no emotion. They're just walking away. Emily Nagoon was a very introverted, external minimalist who wore gray, black, and the occasional saturated color. She was the living embodiment of the phrase, I don't have time for your shit. Granted, Emily had gotten used to Cherry and Hayes' shit over the course of working with them. Her relationship with Cherry and Hayes was like an older sibling looking at one's train wreck younger siblings. Emily would judge, laugh, be sassy, and sometimes be inconsiderate. But at the end of the day, Emily was loving to Cherry and Hayes. But did Emily care or show love for a random stranger or casual friend? Absolutely not. While Cherry was sexually charming and Hayes could be flirtatious, Emily did not showcase any sort of interpersonal skills. It wasn't because Emily was unable to. She just refused on the grounds that people were terrible and she didn't want to interact with them. Emily's special skills included her book smarts intelligence, which was backed up with a magna cum laude bachelor's. Emily also joined some friends for weekly trivia matches at bars, which matched her unimpassioned vibes. Emily would rather melt into oblivion than be caught in a chain restaurant's trivia function. Similar to how snobby actors were offer only, Emily was dive bar and local only, although that didn't stop her from getting a steak at Sizzler's. Emily was the puzzle master among them. She'd connect the dots quicker than a five-year-old on Adderall. Even Emily's hunches and guesses were spot on. Another talent that Emily had was her sneaking skills. Emily was excellent at blending into a crowd or acting as wallpaper. While Cherry was distracting and eye-catching, Emily was the complete opposite. They worked quite well in tandem, with Hayes operating in the middle, ready to adapt to whatever role he needed to do. 
It just made sense that the three of them were private investigators. After all, different personalities brought different things to the table. They balanced each other quite well, even when they got on each other's nerves. Hayes was pretty chill, but Cherry and Emily had completely different outlooks on life. <sighs> I've brought back your drinks. <sighs> Samson was barely able to say since he was still catching his breath. Is there anything else that I can do for you? Not at all, Cherry said with a wide smile that flashed off teeth so white that seeing them might make you think you've died and were currently seeing the lights of heaven. Actually, I think this margarita is missing a lime. Emily cut in like a stern mother reprimanding a child for getting an A on a paper instead of an A+. Oh, she needs that lime wedge. Terry sighed as if Emily had forgotten to ask for a lime wedge that was standard in a margarita. You wouldn't mind grabbing that, would you? Like a golden retriever going after a ball, Samson was off to the bar. <laughs> you got him hooked like a base on Lake Erie. Hayes snickered. Except I don't think they're a good fish in Lake Erie, isn't it just shit water? Samson's not too bad looking either, Cherry surmised, finally inspecting her prey. If he was a fish, he'd probably be in a fancier lake than Lake Erie anyway. Keeping you two on track is impossible, Emily muttered. I feel like I'm babysitting, except without getting paid for it. You're the one sending the waiter to get a lime, Cherry pointed out. That feels the most impossible. It's a margarita. It's supposed to come with lime. Having a margarita without a lime seems like a criminal act, Hayes agreed with Emily. Listen, you deserve the lime. Cherry put her hands up in a way which read, don't shoot. Samson returned with the coveted lime and soon left after gazing at Cherry's chest one more time, like Cherry's boobs were the battery charge that Samson needed to do his job. Once he was gone, Emily herded the conversation back on track. Let's review why we're at, Sizzlers. Emily opened a folder. Mrs. Riviera has asked us to look at her husband, Mr. Henry Riviera. Miss Riviera believes he's cheating on her. She wants proof that she can use in court. And that's where we come in. Are we like recapping what we've done so far? Cherry asked. Well, we know what we've done. Emily began, but Cherry had already steamrolled forward. Well, I went to Mr. Henry Riviera's office and convinced his male office assistant to take photos of his schedule for me. And then I noticed that he had an appointment at Sizzler's for two with no name next to it. Hayes jumped in. That's 100% cheating behavior right there. And that's how we got here, Emily wrapped up. Although it doesn't hurt that tonight's ribeye night. The male secretary is really hot, by the way. We're still talking, Cherry mused. Who are you not talking to? Emily sassed. Uh, Patrick, Cherry confessed. He sent some pics the other day and I was not impressed. Aw, oh, but he was cool. Hayes sighed like his favorite basketball team lost a home game. You brought him to my place last weekend for spritzers. What happened? He was nice. He, he even worked with kids. Parts of him looked like something a kid would have, Cherry implied, with a sour face which caused Emily to nod and Hayes to do a sign of the cross. All right, so I don't even see Mr. Riviera, Cherry sighed, sipping on her happy hour drink. Didn't he have seven in his calendar? He did. I'm going to go to the bathroom. Emily got out of the booth. We just got to Sizzler's and you have to go, Cherry judged. I'm scouting. Emily snapped through her gritted teeth before vanishing. Well, that makes sense, Cherry said before picking up her own margarita. Emily returned four minutes later while Hayes and Cherry were on their second happy hour beverage. He's here, Emily whispered as if Mr. Riviera was right behind her. Mr. Riviera is here, Cherry said loudly. We didn't see him because he's right behind us. Emily hissed so thin and volatile that it was like being punctured by the sharpest and longest needle in existence. Fuck. Hayes squealed out like Stuart Little, who had just inhaled a bit of helium. Did he hear anything? I don't think so. Emily looked unsure, which was problematic considering Emily spent her entire life being sure. Cherry turned around casually. Granted, Cherry turned around in a way in which she considered casual. Truth be told, a herd of camels had more grace than Cherry had in that moment. Cherry instantly recognized Henry Riviera at the table behind them since they had been provided photos by Mrs. Riviera. Mr. Riviera was a very attractive man for being 60, which meant that he had good money. You don't look that good when you're that old without a good skincare routine and some greenbacks. The girl Mr. Riviera was talking with was probably older than Cherry, definitely not as beautiful as Cherry, 
and almost impossibly, looked more like a sex worker than Cherry did. What do you mean you love me? Mr. Riviera's date muttered. Sweetheart, I'm not here for love. I'm here for money. Mr. Riviera's words were soft and Cherry couldn't hear them, but Cherry heard the reply from his date. No, sweetie, I'm sorry. I don't go out with men who love me. I wish you the best. The woman stood out of the booth. There was, what Cherry imagined, was another plea from Mr. Riviera, once again unheard. What's happening? Hayes asked Cherry with wide eyes. Mr. Riviera told his prostitute that he loved her, and that's not going over well for him. Shit, so we don't want to get the evidence we need? Emily gasped. Hurry, get a photo. But the money-only, no-love prostitute was already leaving Sizzlers at a speed that was best described as grease lightning. Fuck, Mr. Riviera's gonna leave too. Hayes looked between Cherry and Emily like a tennis match was happening on the table. We have to do something. Cherry stood up from their table, moved over, and slid into the booth behind them. Mr. Riviera looked up in surprise to see Cherry seated in his booth. Emily and Hayes sat still, as if worried Mr. Riviera would instantly realize that Cherry was a trap. Not to intrude, but that woman was the worst, Cherry sighed. I'm Cherry, Cherry Santiago. I'm definitely far from being the worst. I, well, hello, Mr. Riviera recovered, shaking his head softly as if in disbelief that someone of Cherry's aesthetics was joining him at the table. I'm sorry you had to hear that. I'm not a prostitute or anything. I just hate seeing a nice, handsome man spurned like that, Cherry said in the right tones of pity, but appreciation and complimentary feedback. Besides, I was with casual friends. They won't miss me. Nice and handsome, Mr. Riviera repeated, as if Cherry was speaking a foreign language. He totally slid over Cherry's excuse for why she was at the table. A hot girl giving compliments to an average man caused said average man to glaze over some of the logic. You think? Oh, I just don't think. I know, Cherry cooed. Cherry began to gas up Mr. Riviera, which was quickly realized by Server Sampson, who looked like he had won a lottery ticket and then accidentally shredded it. Emily and Hayes, meanwhile, got plenty of audio and photos of Cherry and Mr. Riviera in non-business conversation. The implication was enough. After all, a business conversation didn't include sexual personalized innuendo. Well, should we take this to a hotel, perhaps? Mr. Riviera asked. Uh, why not? Cherry smiled with a grin as Mr. Riviera slapped a hundred bucks on the table. He stood up and with Cherry in hand, walked to the door. Cherry does know we have what we need, Emily questioned, turning to Hayes with a thin layer of confusion on her face. Is she legitimately going to leave with him? Cherry commits to a role, I'll say that, Hayes chuckled. She commits more than a single woman in her 40s desperate for a wedding. How's your steak? My steak is dry, Emily repeated back. Fits you well then, Hayes smiled while sipping his third drink. Chapter 2 The following Tuesday morning, Hayes and Emily were sitting at their desks at the office of Lorraine Investigative Services. The office was located in Ohio City, a suburb-urban mix located across the river from downtown Cleveland. Like most businesses in the area, Lorraine Investigative Services had taken over the first floor of a house. The living room was reception, and the dining room was where Cherry, Emily, and Hayes crammed together their desks to form a triangle. The kitchen and bathroom had been left alone, while the manager and owner had her private office in the sunroom. The IT guy was given free reign in the basement. It was a tight but cute little operation. Good morning, Hayes smiled as he walked by Secretary Barbara Waters' desk. In this day and age, you didn't need a secretary, but Miss Barbara Waters was a historic institution of Lorraine Investigative Services. She had been the first hire that the owner had brought on, and had been there for many of the defining moments of the business. Besides, Barbara didn't make too much and was looking to retire soon anyway. Good morning, Barbara returned an introduction. She had her good days and her bad days. If there wasn't a tray of homemade goods on her reception desk, that was a sign that Barbara was experiencing a bad day. This particular morning, there were no cookies, scones, cupcakes, or muffins on her desk. Did you hear back from Cherry last night? Hayes asked. I didn't. I assumed the worst, Emily muttered. That Cherry died? No, that she slept with Henry Riviera. Oh, you're right. That's worse than death, Hayes smiled. Sometimes Cherry gets a bit too connected with her case. 
It's a good thing, and sometimes a bad thing. Don't be ridiculous, Emily snorted. When it comes to Cherry, if she's feeling connected, it's usually a bad thing. <laughs> you didn't lie. Do we have the picture printouts and the audio ready? Miss Riviera is going to be here in a few. We're all set. The door opened to reveal the manager and the owner of Lorraine Investigative Services, Claire St. Montgomery. Claire was a fixture in the Cleveland private eye scene, if such a thing existed. Cleveland was big, but was it big enough to have a renowned private detective top ten? Claire had spent about 30 years in the private detective field, although she told people she wasn't even 40, which, if you thought about it, meant that Claire had started real detective work at the age of 10. And while Claire had been known for being a Nancy Drew at a young age, she didn't start getting true experience until the day she turned 18 and began working as an apprentice. A few years ago, Claire expanded her firm due to the caseload. Claire handled the larger cases, as well as the VIP cases from important clients, like solving the case of who was stealing a city councilman's garbage bin, or whether local company Sherwin-Williams had a spy from their competitor working for them. That left Cherry, Hayes, and Emily to soak up the cases which bored Claire, or were otherwise unable to be handled by Claire. Claire's personality was pretty sharp, like most female private eyes. She could be friendly or villainous, a good cop or a bad cop, she could read people like a psychic and could confront people like a white woman spotting minorities holding barbecues. Back in her heyday, Claire was helping nail serial killers and serial rapists. But, as Claire would tell you, she was over the wild days of her youth. She had tenacity, and Lorraine Investigative Services was founded because of that success and boldness. Claire did have one weakness. She was extremely frugal. She'd squeeze every penny she could, like a modern-day Scrooge who had seen the light, but still wanted to be fiscally responsible. Instead of paying a kidnapper ten bucks, Claire would probably try to rescue the ransom assets instead. Well, why are we all standing around like we're waiting in line for elephant ears at the county fair? Claire asked Emily and Hayes, while Barbara handed Claire some mail. We're expecting a client soon, Emily said factually, so we're waiting to introduce and welcome her to the office. Yeah, Emily, you're quite welcoming. You're as welcoming as a funeral party at a little greasy diner, I imagine. Claire eyed the desks, quickly noticing that they were missing their leading lady. And where is Cherry? Hopefully not hung over again. She should be here soon, Hayes said, handing Claire some receipts. From last night. Chalk it up to the expenses. Claire began reading the line items of the receipt and snorted. You each had three drinks. Three drinks too many. I'll cover the food, but you're on your own for booze. Trying to pass off your alcoholism at work? Not on my watch. We would have looked weird without drinks, Emily argued. Everyone has alcohol at Sizzlers. Everyone else was drinking after work, Claire corrected. One drink maybe you could get away with, but not the whole bar's tab. Perfect, so you'll cover our first drinks? Emily shrugged, returning to her computer. And do we have a new case? What about the Hammond case? Claire questioned. Finished, Emily muttered. And the Rugrats case? Also handled. And the Church of the Rainbow Sun case to see who was stealing from the toy drive? That was simple, Hayes chimed in. The camera did most of the work. Well, good thing I'm paying you and not the camera, Claire rolled her eyes. As of right now, there's nothing else to do. Good thing I pay you by the case and not hourly. You might have today off. Great, I can't wait to go from barely making money to not making money. Emily turned to her computer and pulled up one of her favorite blogs while Hayes played a game on his phone. Claire walked into her lush sunroom office and closed the door. Claire's office door was usually closed, which indicated she especially did not want to trifle with inane office shenanigans. Cherry, Emily, and Hayes had a few different ideas to what Claire did in her closed door office, from meditating to diddling. The front door to the office knee house burst open again, and Cherry arrived, panting a little like she had just ran a few blocks to get to the office. No snacks today? Cherry questioned to Barbara, like Barbara's main task was being a chef. I'm the secretary. Barbara's voice sounded like she never made snacks, when in reality, half the week, there was a bakery on her desk. I don't have to bring in food. I know. Cherry sighed with a wave of her red hair, which would have stunned men to silence, but only managed to make Barbara a bit more pouty. 
It's okay, I was counting on you to have snacks, but that's my fault. I'll just go next door to the deli. Barbara opened her mouth and then closed it before returning to her erotica ebook. If there was anyone in the office who knew how to spend time at her desk, it was Barbara, who would revisit Madonna's videography, download new games, submit letters to the editor, shop for new shoes, and text message her friends. Once in a while, Barbara would look at porn, but it was more for studying purposes than sexual enjoyment. It was easy to know when Barbara had recently eyed porn, because she'd ask questions such as, How can someone even fit two of those man Twinkies in there? If you're going to Frank's, can you grab me something? Hayes asked as Cherry approached. Maybe an egg and bacon wrap? Still afraid to see your ex-girlfriend? Emily asked. Definitely, Hayes nodded. Never date someone who works next door to where you work, especially if next door is the best deli in the neighborhood. What happened with that chick? Cherry questioned. Is this the one that you said had, like, negative energy? I might have said that. People say that about me, Emily said coldly. Well, Emily, you're reading a blog called 50 Ways to Appear Creepier Than You Are, Cherry said, peering over at Emily's desk. I don't snoop on you when you read sex advice at work, Emily dimmed her screen, which you might be doing today. After we give Miss Riviera the audio and pictures, we won't have any active cases. Really? Cherry sighed with relief. Oh, I wanted to get a manicure. Henry ruined my nails last night. The metaphorical sound of a record scratch ran through the room. What do you mean? Hayes asked Cherry with confusion. Did you... Did you sleep with Mr. Riviera? Oh, Cherry, please tell us you didn't. Emily's tone was more of the intrigue of the drama and less of the ethics of the situation. Secretary Barbara leaned a bit from her desk to watch the conversation blossom, putting a pause to reading Dreams with Daddy. Listen, I got a bit too carried away with the objective. Cherry pulled out a folder of photos and a flash drive. I went ahead and, well, doubled down on the evidence. You have proof that you slept with Mr. Riviera? Hayes' eyes looked like Marshmallow was ready to pop open. Cherry, you didn't have to sleep with Mr. Riviera, and you certainly didn't need to grab proof that you slept with him. Is the audio good? Barbara called out from reception. I love amateur porn, but when the audio is bad, it's hard to watch. Yikes, that's messed up, Barbara. Cherry muttered. Amateur porn isn't hot because of the audio. It's because it's accessible. I don't care about accessible and intimate amateur porn, Emily snapped. I care about knowing what happened last night when you left Sizzlers. What's to tell? I had a couple of drinks. I was feeling myself and Mr. Riviera is hot. Hot. Yeah, I'm not feeling that word. Emily, you weren't there. Actually, I was, Emily countered, in the booth next door. Remember? Listen, Cherry sighed, putting her folder and flash drive down on Hayes' desk next to the folder and flash drive that showcased Mr. Riviera with his original lady of the night. What's my biggest problem in life? You sleep with random people? Emily answered. You sexually conquer people? Hayes followed up. No, Cherry gasped while Barbara chimed in. You're just a sloppy hoe. It happens to the best of us. All right, calm down, Barbara. Cherry looked personally offended at Barbara's sexual comments, as if Cherry wasn't ten times more likely to converse on topics regarding sex and sexuality. Let's be serious. My biggest weakness. Well, no, I don't think of it as a weakness. So I guess my weakest strength is that I just take things too far. That's an understatement, Emily whispered. Taking things too far would be making out with Mr. Riviera. Having sex with Mr. Riviera would be taking things so goddamn far that you'd need an adjective before the word far could accurately describe how far things went. Well, what about that one time when you tackled that guy? Cherry asked Emily. You mean the man who was about to kill his wife? I tackled him to save her life. It still felt pretty far, if you ask me. Emily and Cherry's fight was interrupted by the front door opening. Mrs. Riviera, who'd looked like she had come by to pick up lottery winnings, brushed by Barbara like she was moldy trash, and made her way to the living room open office space. Morning, Cherry, Emily, and Hayes. You found the evidence that I can use to slice off my husband's balls in court, correct? We have, Cherry nodded, reaching down and picking up her own flash drive and folder of photos. Cherry, that's the wrong... Emily began, but it was too late as Mrs. Riviera opened the folder to reveal photos. 
Cherry, confused, looked back down and realized that she had handed over the wrong folder. Oh my gosh, Mrs. Riviera slowly muttered. We got him! But this woman? Mrs. Riviera eyed the photos and then looked back at Cherry. She did this three times over before connecting the dots. Cherry, are, are you the one who slept with my husband? No, those were photoshopped, Hayes said with a peppy tone, holding up the original photo set in flash drive. We're testing out the new Photoshop program we ordered. I, I don't know what to say. Mrs. Riviera eyed the room with a quizzical look. Maybe you could say that you're shocked we can afford Photoshop on these computers? Barbara said from her desk. We can't even afford decent healthcare packages for the staff. That's true, Emily nodded. My healthcare coverage is so poor that I have yet to see a vet. How does that go for you? Hayes side-eyed. If I'm good, I get a treat. Mrs. Riviera, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to make sure you were able to have a rock-hard case against your husband. Cherry put on her apologetic face, which made most men immediately submit. I... Mrs. Riviera paused, upset that Cherry had banged her husband, but glad that she would have good evidence for divorce court. It's fine. In fact, you're helping me divorce that scumbag and walk away with some chump change. Thank you all for what you did. Mrs. Riviera paid the rest of her deposit with Barbara and soon left with a pep in her step. We closed the case, Hayes cried with excitement. Here comes another 200 bucks. It's a good thing that Cleveland's living costs are dirt cheap, Emily muttered. Cherry, you're lucky that Mrs. Riviera didn't drag us to hell after you slept with her husband. Well, I slept with her future ex-husband. It's not that big of a deal. Can I go get my sandwich at Frank's Deli now? As long as you get mine. He's handed Cherry a credit card. I'll just make sure to tell your ex that it's specifically for you. If there's spit in my sandwich, I'm telling Mr. Riviera to get himself tested. Hayes yelled as Cherry left the house. Cherry on Top is written, produced, and hosted by Matt Rebar. 